sorry, smaller. Uh, it, is, it is smaller in all the right ways, lighter in all the right ways. Uh, the shorter front overhang is dramatic, uh, 45 millimeter shorter. Uh, a lot of this actually came from those LED headlights. Uh, when you're packaging a car, the headlight is in front of the tire. You have to have a tire, a wheel well big enough to let the tire turn, and then enough depth to keep the whole headlight assembly and everything that's, that's in the back of the headlight. Uh, an LED light is a lot shorter than an HID that we had in there before. The, the, the amount of bulk behind the bulb on an HID is, is quite large, and that kind of forces you into a, a longer overhang. So that's why we went ahead and did LEDs across the board all the way down to the base model, so that we can take advantage of the packaging benefits uh, of that LED. Um, we also moved the engine back a little bit farther. Uh, 22 millimeters is not that far. The reason for that is because we've already moved back really far. We started out with it pretty far back on the NA and B. Uh, on the NC, I think we moved it back about five inches. Um, and so it was a real challenge to get it back any farther. Um, I think we got the fire, the, the bell housing plant back about 18 millimeters. And then this engine is actually a little bit shorter uh, than the old uh, two liter. But making that challenge even bigger is that the back of the engine here has um, this uh, high pressure fuel pump for the direct injection, which we didn't have on the previous engine. So we've actually got more stuff hanging off the back of the engine into the firewall, and we still pulled it back. <sighs> Um, this is just showing the, the, the model load as all of us get older and heavier uh, that uh, the, the Miata went through just like the rest of us. Um, we finally went on a diet. This is just the, sort of our, uh, our way in to show you how well we've done on our, our diet. We got within one pound of the late NA car. The NA started out with 1.6 uh, and halfway through the model cycle we put a 1.8 liter in it and added the second airbag and some door beams. Um, and uh, we've got back down to, to that level of weight, which is uh, pretty damn impressive, I'd say. Um, also, in terms of polar moment, the, the rotational inertia of the car, uh, we got that back down within 1% of the 1.6 of our original car, the car that, that, that was completely stripped of the bone. Um, that, that is a huge accomplishment. Um, a lot of that came from you know, taking weight off the extreme ends of the car. We'll get into that in a second. Um, this, this is a required slide for every new car introduction. Uh, we have to have a picture of the, uh, of the body structure and tell you it's 30% stiffer than it was before. Um, this one actually is not, uh, it, usually we're trying to make the body stiffer and lighter at the same time. And the weight target was such a priori priority on this car that in the basic sort of design brief, we were targeting the same body stiffness uh, and using all of the, the, the advancements in, in construction to just reduce weight. Uh, I think in the end, the body did end up being a little bit stiffer than it was uh, but the, the main brief was just to focus on, on weight savings uh, and by using more high tensile strength steel and, and, and a better structure. Um, we're also using more aluminum than we ever have before. This, uh, the red bits here are parts of the aluminum on the NC. The yellow uh, bits are, are, are new pieces of aluminum now. You can see we've added the, the, the fenders. Uh, the bumpers, the extreme ends of the car really contribute a lot to that the polar moment. Um, the, uh, this structure behind the seats is both a roll hoop and a, a cross car beam for side impact. Um, and then uh, in the suspension, we over, we've had forged aluminum double wishbones all through the NC, but the, the upright was cast iron before. Now it's aluminum, it's about half the weight uh, that it was before. I've got that in the petting zoo over here, so I invite you to, to pick it up. Um, the uh, cross members across the tunnel, uh, all aluminum now too as well. Those are also over here because it's Impressive, uh, it's less than half the weight of the steel one uh, for that cross member. Um, again, just more reference for sort of where the where the weight savings came from. Uh, th there's no one thing we can point to. Obviously, we, we, we try to save weight absolutely everywhere. But I want to talk about the uh, the transmission a little bit here. Um, transmission and diff. I think this is a point where you can really sort of see how deeply committed we were to getting this car as light and as perfect as possible. Uh, transmissions and differentials, especially manual transmissions, are the kind of things that you can hold on to for decades because there's no big advancements in the efficiency of a manual transmission. Um, and if you've got one that has the right torque capacity, the right layout, the right size, and already everybody thinks it has the best shifter in the, in the industry, you really don't need to do anything to it. Uh, we still threw out our old six-speed and made a completely new one from the ground up because we found places where we could we could. Um, we were able to save 15 pounds out of this transmission compared to the previous six speed. We were able to make the shift feel even better. Uh, we kept the shift throw the same as it was before. We were able to reduce the effort um, by simplifying the shift linkages. Um, each shift throw, you've got uh, you know, your 
one, two gate, two, three gate, each one of those is moving a different shift rod that's moving a shift fork. Um, and we've got all of those are exactly the same uh, amount of friction. Uh, one, of, one of our uh, shift throws in the old transmission actually had to go through a rod, and a bell crank, and another rod, and a shift fork. And all that extra motion added up to a lot more resistance. And so we had to sort of bring up the shift effort to get everything to match. Uh, by made, having a much simpler shift structure in this thing, we were able to bring the effort down quite a bit. Um, but the big thing we were able to do on this one is, is to improve the highway fuel economy by making the, the one to one gear sixth instead of fifth as it was before. It's very common to have fourth or fifth be your one to one gear and have others be overdrive, which if you think about it, doesn't make any sense at all because the one to one gear is simply connecting the input shaft and the output shaft and bypassing all the gears. That's the most efficient one. It's the least drivetrain loss in a one to one gear. So obviously that should be the sixth gear. Um, I can't honestly explain why we didn't do it before and why everybody else doesn't do it. Um, now the six is one to one, of course, we have to change the final drive ratio because uh, your total gear ratio is your transmission gear times your final drive gear. So if we've made uh, the transmission really short, we need to make the diff really tall. So we went from a 4.1 final drive to a 2.8, and that big a change wouldn't fit in the old housing. So we redesigned the, the diff as well. Oops, back up. Um, the, the, the ring gear on the new diff is the same size uh, uh, as the old one, so we're, we're keeping the same strength. Uh, but we managed to shrink the housing down around uh, around the, the diff, so that actually externally it's a lot smaller. Um, and uh, the, we replaced the cast iron forward housing uh, with an aluminum housing. And we got 15 pounds out of the diff as well, which proportionally to the size of the diff compared to the transmission, getting 15 pounds out of that little thing is really amazing. Um, the steering, uh, obviously it's 2015, so we have electric power steering. Um, to try to make the steering really work right for a sports car, we put the assist on the steering rack instead of up at the column. Uh, and the reason for this is you get a more direct steering response when the assist is down there. Um, when you do the assist up at the column like we do on, on most of our cars, because the package is a lot better than a front drive car, um, you're, you, you end up with all of the torque that you're putting in plus all the torque the motor's putting in all going through the steering column. Uh, and that steering column will, will deflect a little bit as a result of all that torque. So you lose a little bit of steering rigidity. Um, you compensate for that by making it a little bigger, stiffer steering column. But when you're going for lightweight and direct steering effort, you put the assist down at the rack, you can have a thinner, lighter column, and have a lot less torque in that column so, that, so you don't lose any, uh, any directness through that. Um, also, in tuning this steering, um, we use very much the same strategy that we use on, on all of our EPS cars. Um, which is to try to get a, a lot of uh, steering feedback, a lot of buildup in relation to the cornering G. We want the, the, the amount of feedback that you get in a manual steering car, we want that kind of feeling without the absurd amount of effort that you get in a manual steering car. So in order to have the effort build up in proportion to cornering G, uh, we have to start out at a much lower level uh, on center. Uh, our old hydraulic systems tend to have a lot of buildup right around center, a really strong kind of self-centering uh, as a result of that. Um, but if you add all this effort right around center, you can't keep adding effort uh, or else it'll get too heavy at high G. Um, so we break down the effort on center, so it's very, very light and nimble feeling around town. And as you're in, you go deeper and deeper into a corner and drive it hard, you really feel a, a very honest feedback about what, what's going on at the tires. And I mean, this gives you a lot more confidence uh, to understand what the car's doing and know that it's gonna do what you want it to. Um, at the rear of the car, this is a hard diagram to understand, but I'll talk you through it. Um, we've got a multi-link rear suspension, um, which is, uh, remember, uh, suspension designs used to be named after the guy who invented them. Multi-link is designed after a computer, because computers are the only ones that can figure out how these damn things work. Um, but if you look at the back of an NC, it has the five-link multi-link suspension. You look at the back of an ND, it's got a five-link multi-link suspension. It must be the same thing, right? Now, all the links have been moved. It's a whole, whole different deal. So there's two different kinds of passive steering going on in the rear suspension. Uh, one is called a, a compliance steer, which is a, the compliance <laughs> of all the bushings. When you put a side load on the suspension, what does the compliance add up to? A little toe in, a little toe out. Uh, and then there's a kinematic steer, which is when the suspension goes through its stroke, uh, does the compressing it make a toe in, a toe out. Um, and with the NC, we had sort of two conflicting strategies going on. What we were doing is um, th those, those two uh, steering responses happen at first turn the wheel, the 
very first thing that happens is you get a side level on that tire, uh, and you get a little bit of the compliance steer, and then the body rolls, and you get the kinematic steer. And so on the NC, we had a, a compliance tow out. That first load would tow it out, and kind of throw the car into a corner, and then the body would roll, and it would tow back in and stabilize it. Uh, which is really effective to make the car turn in well and, and, and have a lot of uh, cornering power. Um, but it, made, it unsettled some people that it took a little while for the car to, to kind of take a step in the corner. So if you weren't really comfortable with, with, uh, with the tail moving around like that, some people uh, didn't really like it. Uh, so we've made this one have uh, both the, the compliance steer and the kinetic steer are both towing in. So everything is moving in the same direction. It makes for a much more linear uh, turn in response. Uh, and it's sort of a, a, a much more predictable feeling. Uh, the more predictable, the more communicative the car is, uh, the more you can comfortably drive it to its limits. Um, what's going on in this diagram here is simply this, this uh, dotted line is actually the sort of virtual steering axis of the rear suspension. This is the front of the car. Uh, and because this pushing and this pushing are very, very stiff, um, those are the ones that the suspension is kind of pivoting, under, uh, pivoting, pivoting around under compliance. And because that axis hits back here behind the tire, when you put a side load into the tire, it pulls it in a little bit, tows it in. That's, that's how the uh, uh, compliance steer happens. Um, finally, the engine, uh, this is uh, the same Sky Active 2 liter that's in the CX-3. Uh, it's in the Mazda 3 that's in the base CX-5. Um, I think you won't necessarily recognize it as the same engine because we tuned it very differently here. Um, internally, it's exactly the same. Externally, we changed the intake manifold, the exhaust manifold, the oil pan, obviously, uh, a little bit of the cooling, coolant wrapping stuff around the outside. Uh, the very single most important change we made to this engine is, is right here. Uh, the valve cover is aluminum because in a sports car, when you open the hood, you should not see Tupperware. Uh, so we actually spent more money and added a little bit of weight simply so the engine would look right when you open the hood of the sports car. Um, so hopefully you guys can open that and sit there and appreciate it. Uh, we also tuned this engine uh, for premium fuel. Uh, we normally, this engine's got 13 to 1 compression, we normally tune it for 87 octane, which is obviously is a big challenge uh, getting it to, to not knock uh, under those conditions. Um, when you want to have a really sharp throttle response, this quick transients, uh, that quick load transients you have when you snap the throttle open, we'll tend to, to make it knock. So we tend to make the throttle response a little bit softer uh, when we're tuning for regular fuel. If we tune for premium, we can tune for a really sharp response. Uh, and that's where, where all the effort went uh, in the tuning of this car, so having a really sharp response and also having a really um, kind of linear response <coughs> feel uh, through the pedal. Um, on, on the NC, we, we front loaded the uh, throttle response a little, perhaps a little bit too much. So the second half of the throttle um, didn't feel like it was doing anything. It, it was doing something rate of change of the acceleration was, was kind of below perceptible level. And we figured out where that perceptible level is for most people and, and retuned the, the, the throttle stroke um, so that you can feel any input you make, you can feel a response from it. That's sort of a very fundamental thing. Um, in terms of actual power output, all the hoopla over this engine making less power than, than the old engine, here's the reality of the situation. The old engine made more power at 7,000 RPM, which matters a lot if you're at 7,000 RPM. But when you're not at 7,000 RPM, it doesn't matter what fit. Um, if you look at this chart, from 1,000 RPM to 6,000 RPM, the new engine makes more power. The reality is you can't grade an engine on a single data point. You've got to look at the whole power delivery. Um, and really, you need to look at the whole power delivery and the vehicle weight and the gear, which is what this chart does. Uh, this is power to weight on the vertical axis and speed. So we've got gearing is determining the speed, uh, and the power to weight is, is obviously the power to weight. Uh, and you can see that in most of the time, the, the new engine is more powerful in almost every real condition uh, than the old one was. And that's, that's why less power uh, is adding up to faster. It's not just power to weight, it's, it's, the, it's that broad door curve. 